Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of our Tech Talk series. This is Tony Battaglia of Three Wave Technologies, and I will be moderating the session. Today's topic is environmental and social governance, or better known as ESG, which has become quite a growing topic of interest in the energy space. So if you're not familiar with ESG, you'll certainly learn quite a bit about it on this session. And there's also a pretty good deal of information available online as well. So we have a pretty diverse and great group of panelists today. So let's go around for some introductions. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Massey. Speaking of automation, my automatic lights went off. I am the remote automation solutions sales manager uh, for Vincent Process Controls out of the Louisville corporate office. My name is Ryan Hetzer. Testing, testing. With Vincent Process, I serve as the business development manager for our uh, North Texas, West Texas, and New Mexico customer base. Hi, my name is John Pfeffer, and I'm a senior air quality professional for Trihydro Corporation. I'm located in the Golden, Colorado office. Hi, my name is Greg Corey. How does my audio sound? I'm the director of support for FreeWave and I handle our pre and post sale technical support. And I am John Strack. What you're saying, automation isn't perfect. And I'm the product line manager for software at FreeWave. So our edge software platform and also based in Colorado. Right, fantastic. Well, let's get this kicked off. Are you seeing any examples where operators are installing systems and equipment to demonstrate that they're proactively managing their operations to limit emissions of vapors and greenhouse gases? Uh, yeah, we sure are. I think um, really beyond the regulatory requirement, there's been a trend in the industry toward uh, these types of voluntary or proactive type emission reduction programs. Um, right now, we're beginning to see a push from some of the downstream gas purchasers, for example, uh, an example might be an LNG company or a natural gas utility that uh, purchases gas from the upstream operator or producer, and uh, they're really requiring their producers to be able to demonstrate that their operations are have lower emissions than, say, an average against their peers or an average in a basin. Um, at Trihydro, we're also involved in some direct, uh, you know, voluntary emissions monitoring work for clients. Uh, we do direct measurement using air monitors uh, and as well as using optical gas imaging cameras to check for leaks at facilities. And also doing some uh, acoustic monitoring where we're using acoustical devices to look for leaks uh, through a valve, for example, uh, to try to minimize emissions at a site. Um, also starting to see operators install uh, direct online flow measurement systems for tanks. Uh, storage tanks and compressor vents, for example, and uh, seeing automated uh, yeah, tank gauging systems go in to uh, take the place of uh, manual, manual gauging through thief hatches on tanks uh, and eliminating that as an emission source. Again, seeing that both on the regulatory side, but also seeing that in the voluntary application by some clients who don't have that as regulatory requirements today. Fantastic. You know, it's great to see folks taking the, the voluntary proactive measures to, to get the ball rolling on that front. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of the coin, what are some of the specific regulatory drivers that are uh, currently in place for online monitoring of that equipment? Um, generally seeing, seeing this at the state level, um, there are states that are promoting more electronic uh, monitoring, but also electronic data management things such as automated tank gauging systems to eliminate use of thief hatches for that purpose, to eliminate that emission source and also eliminates the opportunity for an operator to accidentally leave one of those hatches open, which uh, you know, can be problematic from an emissions source perspective. Um, also seeing some trend, regulatory trend toward fixed perimeter monitoring, a kind of a new thing um, coming, coming in Colorado, for example, but also elsewhere uh, to have fixed monitors at oil and gas production sites where, uh, where they're looking to monitor with an array of, of fixed instruments and a meteorological station looking to better understand what the emissions from those types of either pre-production and post-production operation activities of oil and gas well sites actually is relative to what might have been estimated from emissions factor basis in the past. And so that's being driven by regulation uh, here and elsewhere, uh, but also 
uh, allows the operator to respond quickly should there be an emissions release event. Um, these systems typically you know, use traditional SCADA systems to acquire the data and to manage that data and to communicate it either locally or to a more regional based uh, user, either whether it's a client that's, that's needing that data or a community that that data might be reported into. Um, and I suspect we're going to see this come about at the federal level as well as time goes by. Uh, thank you for the detail there. So what considerations do the producers and the users take into account when trying to prove an ROI or a business case to, to move in this direction? You know, it, ROI is probably a tough nut to crack on that, but I think the I think I think a business case can be made for this. Um, you know, in addition to the um, the other items I mentioned before, I think operate we'll continue to see operators with a need to implement these approaches as part of uh, what can be called a social cost of doing business. These ESG concepts are going to continue to grow in importance to them as as uh, operators, but also to their customers, as I mentioned, and to their investors. Um, it's, it's difficult to measure return on investment on these types of things, but I think, uh, I think employing ESG concepts is gonna continue to be a critical factor going forward. Um, you know, operators that can demonstrate their operations are lower in emissions, and in particular, lower in greenhouse gas emissions will not only see the economic benefit of keeping the product in the pipe, but they'll, they'll also be viewed as that operator that those downstream producers want to do business with. Uh, essentially, we're looking at a greening of the entire supply chain upstream through transportation downstream to sales um, and, and demonstrating that a given operator is a, a desirable business partner. Yeah, John, I think that's well said. I was going to mention you know, in these cases, there's tangible and intangible benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned keeping the product in the pipe. That, that's a tangible, uh, obviously, rather than paying a fine for a event uh, or a flare event or uh, getting paid for selling that product. You know, those, those things you can obviously put a pencil to easily, but there's other risks that can be mitigated. Uh, there's always safety risks, uh, and it's hard to put a pencil to those. Uh, but those are real, and each company can evaluate that on their own uh, efforts. But also, there is the social license to operate, as you mentioned. You know, being able to to do business with different people, being able to do business in different areas, based on uh, how you are perceived in in the uh, environmental circles, how you treat the area, the people in that area, uh, the 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 world around you. Mike, something you just brought up there. Um... One of the many things uh, was safety. So from the automation space, what implications would you say these solutions have on safety? Well, John mentioned one uh, when he was talking about keeping thief hatches closed. Um, you know, you, you want to protect uh, your employees from uh, harmful gases or vapors. So that may be present, uh, but also slip, trip and fall hazards, uh, just climbing uh, up on tanks, even in good weather uh, can be dangerous. So uh, the least uh, or, or the, the more you can remove that type of operation, the better you are from a risk perspective and, and safety. Um, also, by adding things like the automatic tank gauging that was mentioned um, and tracking some of your um, uh, relief valves and, and thief hatches for open scenarios and, and venting scenarios, knowing what's taking place on that vessel. Uh, you can uh, in, increase or, or decrease trips to site, uh, which also is a, is a big safety risk. On that note, we've actually, when I have conversations with some of my producers out in West Texas, they discuss or they refer to their tank battery as, of the future as an unmanned site. You need to make sure that there's an understanding amongst the facilities engineers as well as the operators on the ground that um, we, we do need to make sure that the equipment is is properly maintained and you know beyond that we've got devices specifically for flashback and uh, flare flashback events right and um, continue to try to raise education and awareness of, of what is required we just try to partner up the best we can to, to let to provide education 
training, whatever, whatever may, whatever information may may need to be shared in order to make sure that there's not a false sense of security. And uh, at the end of the day, they can they can rest easy knowing that they are, you know, properly protected or as well protected as they can be. Very good. Thank you, guys. Um, so a lot said so far, a lot of uh, very specific use cases, but I guess taking a step back and going a little bit more high level, what are some of the other areas where automation can support some of these ESG improvements initiatives and goals? I'd say that uh, it's each case is unique because of equipment that's installed, the age of the equipment, the type of the equipment that's used, there's different scenarios that come into play, uh, but uh, you know, we've, we've had practical experience working through almost every scenario from uh, the different uh, um, lower ounce uh, tank setups, like six eight ounce tanks, now moving to 16 ounce, preventing uh, the tankless site and uh, how those interact and how the equipment needs to be set up to make sure that those function properly so that you don't have downtime, but you receive the benefits of an, you know, a site that is zero emission capable. I want to add on to that from, you know, FreeWave's perspective, the role that we play in these systems is that, you know, we have all this data that's stranded out in the field and that data needs to be retrieved somehow. When you're dealing with field operations that have assets, you know, scattered across a large geographic area, sometimes you know, there might not be fiber there. Um, maybe there's no cellular coverage from Verizon or AT&T. So uh, FreeWave, you know, for the past 26 years or so of our existence has been providing that communication to bridge that gap in order to retrieve that data that's stranded in the field. Because when we're talking about ESG goals, you have to define what your goal is, and then it has to be measurable and then you have to have a way to retrieve that data in order to compare that against your goal to see, you know, if you're being effective um, in meeting that specific goal. So that's kind of, that's been a key focus for FreeWave is bridging those communication gaps. A lot of good points brought up there. Um, you know, we're, we're naturally migrating toward the, the data discussion, which is a big element of this discussion. Um, so just naturally, we're talking about adding more equipment in the field, getting additional data points. Uh, with more equipment comes a bigger need for data and uh, poses a lot of complications when trying to pull meaningful data, especially when in remote and environmentally hazardous locations. How can that data help with reporting and compliance? Are there any regulations specifically on data? We do see some of those requirements within uh, the regul regulations from a, at a state level. Um, so we, we do see that uh, as, as a requirement in various locations. Um, the, you know, the data is important uh, for a lot of reasons, not just the reporting aspect of it, but that is, that is one key aspect. You know, if operators want to be compliant, they must uh, follow the regulatory requirements, uh, whatever those may be. But I think, um, the, the accuracy and consistency of that data, the ability for it to be consistently reported is, is somewhat critical here. A lot of these locations for oil and gas facilities are remote, don't have, in some cases, really very reliable electrical supply, uh, but also communication being a, a, a major challenge for that. Um, but the automation and instrumentation can, can drive accuracy and, and validity of the data, which is important to regulatory agencies for sure. I think it's also um, you know, critical that, as, as I had mentioned before, some, some of the other drivers that are non-regulatory are actually uh, you know, requirements for operators to be able to certify their emissions intensity um, so that um, end users understand what that carbon intensity is, uh, it's become a, a point of measure across the industry and, and a point of importance to those end users. Um, if you don't measure it accurately, you, you know, you can't rely on that data to be, to be used effectively. Uh, many, of, many in industry are, are really focused at this time on 
how do I, how do I go after and, and achieve emission reductions and your ability to measure accurately and automate controls such, such that you're able to, to manage those emissions properly can, can be critical in your ability to have real reductions, which is you know, key to this whole concept of ESG. Um, you, you must be able to measure it in order to be able to reduce it. I think, uh, you know, you are, we are seeing the, the, the shift away from what would maybe be a historical uh, emission factor-based estimation approach to, uh, you know, real-time measurement, continuous measurements uh, as being the, the, the approach that's expected now and, and uh, will be the approach used. Uh, utilizing instrumentation, direct measurements, and uh, direct reporting, you know, real-time reporting. Yeah, uh, I think that's the great thing about the edge software trend from a data perspective is that you can get that data that was stranded before now at a lot higher resolution, a lot faster, you know, even if there are remote data collection problems. So, you know, I, I think the the soft from the software perspective, and I'm the software guy. Um, there's you know there's a lot of uh, benefits being provided uh, to the operation from having the the edge software available, and they're therefore making the data available too. How can how can folks migrate from a very traditional model? where the data has been less, um, data requirements have been less intensive than what we're talking about right now to a model where we see some big increases and improvements on how data is collected, distributed, and reported. Yeah, I, I think the, from the, the transition perspective, you know, the idea of fully changing up a data operation to be edge-based is so, sometimes pretty overwhelming. But it doesn't have to be. You can certainly uh, start small with a few sites and get your new system in place in parallel to keeping your existing data collection and SCADA system in place. So the, the edge system doesn't have to take over on day one. You can get it working how you need before scaling it out. So I think a, a transition to make it easier for the producers and customers is definitely possible. Yeah, I think that uh, a, a lot of the information that's being collected is being managed in the field uh, by a controller, in our case, uh, an RTU, uh, remote terminal unit that's out there doing computations, managing IO for safety systems and doing local measurement. What's collecting that data? And uh, then you have an edge device like the Zoom IQ product from Freeway would talk to that RTU, collect all of the data uh, from that site and evaluate it against criteria so that you don't overwhelm your SCADA system with data. And then send the data that it needs to, what's changed in the last five minutes or send me the average over the last five minutes or if it exceeds a certain boundary, send me that piece of data but don't flood me with every piece of data unless it's changed and I want to know about it. So you have access to real-time data, you have access to high-speed data, but you're only seeing the changes. And so in that way, it can interface with the legacy SCADA system very effectively. But you want to be collecting that data and putting it into a data lake somewhere so you can analyze it, look for those patterns, those clusters of things that are happening uh, to evaluate you know, what other opportunities you have to improve your process to uh, be more responsible and uh, be more efficient as an operator. Yeah, she really is the next step in that. It's not only are we caring about the well-being of our employees, but are we looking over the health of our environment, over the health of our community? It's taking a kind of a broader approach to safety, you know, not just the individual, but society overall. So probably over the next 20 years or so, you know, you're going to see a focused focus on how those things affect overall the communities we serve, you know, not just the individual safety. These global producers have all adopted these far reaching future goals. They want no carbon footprint by 2050. And so you're throwing that goal out there and now you're challenging your team how are we going to get there? What are, what are the avenues that we need to take to become better environmental stewards? And 
lots of outside the box thinking, right? I mean, it's, it's well beyond just let's get a tighter thief hatch, right? It's, it's, there's, there's layers upon layers right now. We're looking at a uh, pilot operated technology that's essentially a bubble type, right? And an, as a means to replace the thief hatch. Um, there's, and so systemically things will change. We've got folks who are entertaining the idea of going flare less at the tank site, right? So how can we capture that gas that's being produced or separated uh, that would typically go to sales? How can we get that back in the ground um, as opposed to going to flare if, if the midstream company happens to go down? There's lots of really interesting concepts that are getting kicked around and uh, um, it's, it's exciting. <clears throat> Well, thank you, everybody, for joining this edition of our Tech Talk. Thank you to all the panelists for chiming in and contributing here. Uh, we feel like this was a very strong and productive conversation. If anybody at, in the audience has any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us directly, and we'll be sure to continue the conversation with you. Thank you.